Okay, welcome to the very first podcast in Brass and Woodwinds for the uh, semester, and this one is on environmental concerns. I would recommend as you view this that you have the notes that were distributed in class in front of you, and then you can make uh, little notes beforehand. At the conclusion of watching this brief video, then you are to go to the class website under video discussions, find environmental concerns, and then enter any questions you have or any uh, points that you found helpful, anything you want to add, maybe practices that you saw, directors you had, and so forth, uh, executing that. Sorry you have to look at me this whole time. I have to do that too, but we'll all kind of grin and bear it. Um, so we are doing environmental concerns today, and as you can see on the slide in your notes, key number one, be organized, plan, and act ahead. Um, seems obvious, but this is really where probably the biggest pitfall pitfall of teachers get themselves into trouble is they get fatigued, they get um, unfocused, and they don't make the time to really think through what they have to do all day, so therefore they're making it up as they go along, and uh, just the energy and demand of working with those students and all the other demands of your job just run you over like a freight train sometimes. And for some people, they never recover from that. That's just how they live their teaching career, and I don't want you to be those people. Um, with that then, I think it's very important that you understand that the environment you set is one of the things that you can control, especially in that first job, uh, especially when you get a space that's yours. Um, you got to remember that, um, that's the third point on here, that you're at first, if you don't change anything about that, odds are a very high percentage of those kids that are coming into that room to meet you every day have been in that room for maybe a year, maybe two, maybe three in a small school. Maybe they've been there five or six years in that room. So, I mean, you're the foreign element in the host body. And just like in our own human bodies, when we get a foreign element in it, I mean, the host body works to expel it. And obviously, you don't want that kind of an, uh, antagonism against you, what you're trying to do and everything. One way you can turn the tables is to take control of that environment. Make it yours. Um, even within the scope of a year or a week, month, whatever, change the perspective in there. Clean things up. Uh, consider which direction things are faced. Consider uh, what kind of positioning is best for that class. Consider what's on the walls. If you've got band camp posters from the 60s or 70s up that nobody's bothered to ever take down, I mean, clean house on everything. Give them, put forth the effort to make it your space. Um, another important point on here, the broken windows theory. Some of you have heard this maybe before, but in uh, the uh, 70s and early 80s um, in New York City, high crime, the crime rate was very, very high, and um, uh, just the quality of life issues were really poor, um, and subways were graffitied and smelled and blah, 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 just all kinds of problems there, and they had a new mayor and police chief come in, and they took it upon themselves to test this broken windows theory. I'm kind of abbreviating all this, and that basically was uh, based on the notion that um, if you observe like a vacated building, as long as there are no broken windows in it, people will tend to just walk by and ignore it. But as soon as there's graffiti on it or a broken one window's broke, um, even the most honest, rule-abiding person is going to be tempted to pick up a brick and break another window. And then another window gets broken, another window gets broke. So I guess it's what it's sort of saying is that we tend to, our behavior tends to rise or fall to the expectations subliminally given us by our environment. That's your job. You set that up. So um, st strongly, strongly consider doing whatever you can to sort of knock everybody off center from what their expectations are. And of course, since you're the one that made the changes, it's comfortable to you. So for that brief period of time, you're in a position of comfort and it's not really power, but I guess you could call it that, but they're a little off balance. And that gives you time to implement more of the way you want things to uh, progress as the new person. Okay, moving on. Very important procedurals. Um, you've got the space the way you want it. Um, you know, it's a beginning class, so you decide you want to set the chairs up in grids where you have like four feet in between each kid where you can get anywhere. You don't have to teach from the front of the room. You can use your proximity and so forth. Think about the procedural necessities needed for that room, that group of children, 
and that class what's going to be going on in that room. Maybe at the beginning you just want them to put their books down on a table as they come inside the door quietly. Maybe you even have them hold their finger up to their mouth. I'm not saying do that, but you could. And they would, especially sixth graders, would not object to this. Walk in, hold their finger up to their mouth, find their seat, sit, be quiet until you have them do anything else. Um, think through. If you're the type of person that is highly organized, is a little bit on the OCD side or whatever, you're going to think more clearly. You're going to be clearer in your instructions if you have their undivided attention. So whatever it takes, those procedures that you want them to follow entering the room, those procedures you want them to follow getting their instrument cases, the procedures you want them to follow opening the case, assembling the horn, how to ask a question, just absolutely everything. Those, those are not rules and those are not expectations. They're procedures. And um, it, what you ha you'll for soon have to learn though, what, what poor teachers have a tendency to do is they'll think through some pretty good procedures and they'll tell the students what the procedure is. Maybe they'll even practice it once. But when students don't follow them, they don't go back and practice them. They may talk about them, but they don't practice them. I think it's key that, regardless of the age level, that if you want to reinforce what a procedure is, you need to practice the procedure physically. Um, I've known really good 4A, 5A band programs that we've had student teachers at that have reported they've been in February or something and things are getting a little loosey, kids are talking more at the beginning, they're maybe a little bit late to their seat, they're not warmed up like they used to be, uh, whatever, preparation just isn't the same, the focus isn't the same. That the teacher has just calmly gone in and said, I don't like how we're starting class, we're going to practice how we need to start class. Had everybody put their stuff away, had everybody go out in the hall, had everybody you know, with supervision and instruction, how they want, and done that once, twice, three times, maybe a fourth time for good regard. It doesn't have to be mean. It's not punishment. It's just this is so important that we need to do this right. And if they're not doing it right, you got to call them on it. And you have to decide, is it enough just to mention it? Or is it something we need to stop everything, practice this, do it right? Because this is so important. If we do it wrong, we can't do anything else right. I don't think that's a waste of time at all, especially with your sixth grade classes and that, and then carrying that through as they get older and that. Um, in short, teaching proper procedures is never a waste of time, but I promise you, it will feel like you're wasting time because you're not making music, you're not playing the horn, you're not learning anything about music, but the behavior, if you don't get that in line, you're not going to be able to do those things efficiently anyway. Um, next thing, stands. If you've noticed in our own classes, we haven't even used a music stand yet. Why? Because we haven't looked at anything. As soon as you put a diversion in front of those students, then they're diverted. Um, by the same token, you put that stand there from your perspective, wherever you are in the room, it's a barrier. Already the paradigm, I, I believe the paradigm of how we do most of what we do in ensemble music is, is really, really flawed in that we put this person in the center front of the room and then put a barrier in front of them and then between us and the group of people we're leading we ask for this open communication to go on. Um, if you think about it in terms of, 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 of the physical dynamic of the whole thing it's, it's, it's really kind of hypocritical. Um, every child has a stand in front of them blocking them from you. They're pointing instruments at you. Um, you're pointing a stick at them. You have a stand, maybe a harmony director, maybe a metronome, maybe a table, maybe a keyboard of some kind in front of you. These barriers, it's almost like a war and you've got your wall, you've, they've got their wall and you're going at it. So I think it's very, very important that when you um, don't use stands until you need them. And if it's a day you're going to teach something that they really don't need to read anything, that's fine. The first half the hour, if it's a small class perhaps, no stands. Have them get it when they need it. Because once you bring that in, then you need to use it. If not, it's a waste of being there. Now you may ask yourself, well, what if the class before this one's an advanced class and we use stands? you got to weigh that. To me, it's worth the 30 seconds to get a couple kids to come in early or to get the class that's leaving to put their stands where you want them out of the way and maybe reconfigure the room rather than having people come in. And with that said again, beginner settings should not look like band settings. They should look like beginning classrooms. And to me, if I've got 16 people in that beginning class, the most effective setup you could make 
to me is a four by four grid uh, if you can four feet apart each chair from the other where you can teach where you can uh, individual give individualized instruction to any student at any time and get to any point in that room probably in under two seconds um, and you can you can use your proximity the power of what it feels like to those children when you come right up next to them it's no different with you guys when you're 21 if I do that to you than with them if they're 11 and you know you're 23 um, there's huge power in that but as soon as you put yourself on a podium and put it behind a block you've advocated all that power also consider don't have the kids have any more equipment at their chair than they need if they, there's probably no reason to have their book bags at their chair there's probably no reason to have class books at their chair there's just just have them what they need have have with them what they need if you're not using cases that day for whatever reason at the beginning don't have them get their cases at the beginning just try to keep things what's going to work best for you and think those th things through ahead of time make that part of your planning as you do it again chairs are inanimate objects they're not, they shouldn't be virtually glued down where they are all day long. Every one of your classes is different. I think the worst thing you can do, again, I'm going to say this again because it's that important, is to teach a beginning class with the kids setting within an advanced band concert setting. It's just poor. The kids on the front row get more attention. The kids on the second row get less. If there's kids on the third row, they get even less. You cannot manipulate yourself through the ensemble easily. Um, you have all kinds of distractions. Those stands are probably there. The chairs are probably too close together for beginners, especially as they're manipulating their cases and assembling large instruments for the first time. And that clear the room, set up what you need or clear up a portion of the room and set up what you need and then move it back. I'd also advocate with um, advanced ensembles, um, leave yourself what I'll refer to as uh, power alleys. In other words, set the room up in an arc, but within the arc, leave an aisle, maybe uh, four chairs in on your left, in the middle, and then four chairs in on your right, where you can any time just go right down the middle or the side of that ensemble and you're within two chairs of being able to correct an embouchure or touch a shoulder to get somebody's attention or point at something in their music right away where you won't have to worry about anything. Um, think about too as you use chairs, the very beginning. Those kids were in elementary school. I guarantee you 99% of them in their elementary music class, they never sat in a chair. They sat cross-legged on a floor on probably some kind of marker or something. And that's what they expect when class starts. Put it this way, they don't expect anything different than that. They probably have no expectations whatsoever. So at the beginning, if you don't want to have to teach posture, then don't use chairs at the beginning until you need them. Have them sit on the floor. That way they can be a little bit more hunched over. They can be a little bit more casual with their um, body, body positioning and so forth. But then once you put that chair in, when they're ready to play and use the instrument, you can emphasize and make it very, very clear and maintain their execution of correct posture to play that instrument correctly. So uh, just something to consider what you do. Um, and especially with those sixth graders. With, with kids that have already experienced band, advanced kids, th a lot of these things are going to be hard sells. You're going to have to do them little by little. Um, you're going to have to practice procedures more. You're going to have to be more emphatic about things. But sixth graders, they initially, those first days, want to fit in. They want to succeed. They want to please you. They want to be successful. They want to be happy. And so they will eat out of your hand. Just make sure you're feeding them good information. Next thing, where are you going to keep things? Um, it may seem obvious, maybe based on your room and facilities and equipment and storage lockers, whatever you have shelving, it's very, very obvious. But a lot of times that isn't the case, and maybe even what looks obvious might not be the best use. Maybe there's ways to segregate storage in different places where beginner storage is on this part of the room and advanced storage is on this part of the room. Um, different things like that. Um, if you can label lockers and shelves and spaces on shelves and uh, different places that are personal with their names and or some sort of identification, numbers or labels of some kind beforehand, then do it. Um, even seating at the beginning. Remember we did at the very beginning. I didn't make a big deal out of this, but just even having a note card with their name on it. They can be color-coded by instrument. They can be color-coded by grade level. 
Um, you can get information you need about like their email address or their parents' phone number, their parents where they work, uh, whatever you would need, their locker combination number if they're bringing their own locker for their band locker, uh, that sort of thing. You can put those note cards down, dictate where you want them to sit the first day. They know where to sit. Have them hang on to the note card. Maybe have some blank ones down in case you have some students show up in class that you weren't you know, aware of because especially in public school, you always have kids that register at the last minute. They may not be on your roster or they might be in the wrong class. Um, those kids have them put their name on their uh, blank card. Collect those note cards. Pick up the ones that nobody showed up for. Those are your absences. The ones that everybody showed up for, those are the people that were there. You've taken attendance without having to call roll, without having to boggle over mispronouncing names, which you can imagine I did all the time. Um, also think through in terms of materials and that. Give space. Um, you know, there's probably no reason you ever want a tuba case to come out into your rehearsal hall unless it has to be stored there. At, at worst, it should be in the very back or back side of the room out of the way and it should always stay there. There's no reason ever to have a tuba case, a Barry Sachs case, um, anything that big in, a, in an advanced group. In an advanced group I would even say other big cases by the chairs. It's just distraction um, and such. Beginners, a little different story in terms of uh, trombones and maybe even euphoniums and that, but think through those things. If you haven't looked at a French horn case in a long time, those things take up a ton of of uh, uh, space and uh, take up a lot of land so they're really in inconvenient the way they set so think through those things what's going to work best where you can do a good job teaching um, this is really really important with young kids and I, I think by young I mean high school age and that begin and end every instructional period in the same manner make it semi predictable so there's a feel to it they like routine. They perform better in routine. Now with that said, don't take it to the nth degree and make every rehearsal a complete uh, duplication of the one before it. The middle is what changes creatively. Okay? But, you know, start with focus. Start with routine that they understand, with behaviors they understand. You have the middle and then end with, remember this word, closure. End with closure you know in a Socratic fashion at fashion ask them what did we do today what did we learn today what did I emphasize today what did you feel like we need to do better tomorrow you know you tell them things sort of it's like ending the class like wrapping a present and you're tying the bow on the top of it so conclude and include in that closure this is what we're going to be doing tomorrow this is what I want you to look at tonight this is what I hope to accomplish this week Alright, so again, you're refocusing before you completely release out into the world. Um, along these lines too, make sure as you plan, devote a specific time to present a single concept. So much of what we do as instrumental music teachers is teaching multiple concepts and executing multiple concepts, and by multiple I mean sometimes 8, 9, 10, 11 things at once uh, perfectly. But, but kids need to master each of those components or each of those individual concepts um, individually to a very, very high level before they can start combining those conflicts. Throughout this semester, you're going to hear me refer to as TLC, and that's the approach I'm going to try to teach you where we think about tone, we think about literacy, and we think about coordination aspects of playing instrumental music separately and work on those things separately as much as possible before we combine them into a complete musical attempt at something in different ways. That way you run a much greater risk of more, maybe even all, students understanding what you're teaching, um, being able to execute the skills that you want them to perfect, and being able to carry those understandings and skills over to the next challenge you're going to have rather than just assuming it and always having to go back to the beginning and move forward again. Uh, the whole key here is, in, is efficiency. Um, if you can be real efficient, they'll be happier, they'll be more successful, and you will have an easier job and a more enjoyable job because you'll be able to do more challenging things and they will, uh, you'll be happy with the results you get from them. 
as you start adding this litany of concepts you're covering, don't think that you have to cover everything every day, but do try to plan to cover all of the key concepts over the course of a week, depending on, I would use the um, measuring of a week if you see them every day. If you see them every other day, which some people unfortunately do in their situations, maybe that's over two weeks. Uh, maybe it's still a week and you cover fewer concepts, but think through those things. Think broad. Um, it's not just what you do in class and then you keep adding another thing on, adding another thing on, adding another thing on, and you still do all that. To a certain extent, there's some truth in that, but you need to, as you add something on, shorten or eliminate something else and then come back to that the next day. You have to trust, and this is why it's so important that they understand something, as, as soon as possible after you introduce something and, and can master it. Um, if they have the mastery, you can leave it a day or, or, or not address it as uh, distinctly one day, and it will be there um, two days later. And that, But do cover everything within a week. You get much beyond a week, and then things start getting lost. Uh, for most of us, a really good example of this. I, I would add to this, too. I'm going to change the thought here. Add to this, too. Inter try to think of introducing your concepts based on, and this is a key phrase, their need to know. If it's something they don't need to know yet, really question whether you should be introducing it yet. If there is something they absolutely need to know right now, then absolutely teach it. Let me give you an example. Um, a lot of us in sixth grade, when we were beginners, you were probably taught six, eight time at some point. And you probably even had a lesson on it one day. You did six, eight time. Maybe you did it for a week. But then I'd also bet that you went maybe six months, a year, two years, even three years before you ever used it. And then you went to use it. And of course, most of the people in your class didn't remember anything about it because it's complicated. And the teacher probably got upset because and, say, and probably even said something like, I taught you that in sixth grade. Well, the tragic truth is, if they don't know it, you didn't teach it. Okay, you told them about it, you talked about it, maybe you even did some activities with it, and they had a minor understanding of it. But if they didn't master it to the point that they can carry it forward to application, you didn't teach it. And that's what you have to think. My solution is, well, no, you don't have to teach 6-8 better. It's just if you think it's important to teach 6-8 at that point, then you need to create a reason for them to know it by playing something in 6-8 regularly, whether it's an exercise, a warm-up exercise, a scale exercise, a small piece, a melody, whatever it is, if it's important. If you're not going to do that, then don't introduce it yet. Wait until it is pertinent and introduce something else and perfect and master something else. Um, again, in terms of expectations, you'll drive yourself crazy if uh, curricular expectations, you think about them in short term because Kids don't master things in a day. Um, they move towards mastery in a day. Think more in terms of a week and think more in terms of how far have we progressed towards where we are. Also in terms of expectations and what you want to teach them, both curricularly and everything else that, 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 that goes within how a child acts and interacts within your band program, set the right expectations. Okay? In the position I was at with two assistants and uh, homogeneous classes and band meeting every day for 50 minutes, my expectation was for every child by the end of sixth grade to know on their instrument by memory and be able to play on their instrument all 12 major scales, full range, at a certain tempo, by memory, with arpeggios at the end of the year. And I would say pretty confidently probably 75% of our kids demonstrated that at the end of the year. I mean really demonstrated at the end of the year and 25 struggled with it to a certain point, but they did more than if we hadn't expected that. If I was teaching somewhere else and I had no assistance and had that same schedule, I would not have those same expectations. Worse yet, if I was teaching somewhere else and I only saw my kids for 30 minutes a day every day, again, I would have different expectations. If I only saw them every other day, my first teaching job, I only saw my beginners once a week in small classes for 30 minutes, totally different expectations. So make sure you set the right expectations as you go through and realize you can make the right decision on those things. Sometimes when you find out your friends got banned for 90 minutes a day, five days a week, and twice on Saturday, they can expect different things than you who only sees their kids twice a week for 30 minutes. So 
But by the same token, you can expect the same level of mastery. You just don't master as much. Um, plan your interactions. Um, as you introduce something, think how you are going to, and I'm going to skip to the bottom of this little section here, coach. Because these kids need to then practice. And to me, coaching is guided practice. And it's a really good word for what I think we need to be doing mostly. We introduce something, and then we guide their practice of it. We do it again and again and again, and we move constantly around the room, both physically and with our eyes and with our ears, and we make subtle corrections and encouragements to get them to still be motivated to want to do their best. Remember again, you are at your most effective if you can constantly move around and vary your perspective. It not only helps with their behavior, it helps you identify problems. Somebody sitting three rows away from you, their posture looks different to, from you from the front than it does from the side. If posture looks different from the right side than the left side. Hand position looks different from this angle as opposed to this angle. And you need to vary all those angles, visually and orally and physically, every way possible, constantly, so you can really hone in on them doing everything right and keep them from developing as um, bad habits. You want to develop as few bad habits as possible. Okay? So assess and realize all those, if I walk back to you know a young man playing something and I adjust where his pinky is on the trumpet or something, I've assessed, I've corrected, I've reinforced. That's what you're doing. You're constantly assessing. You're constantly deciding what's the next thing to do. You're diagnosing, if you will. Maybe you like that word better than assess. And again, remember those are formative assessments. If I give a chair test at the end of the week that I'm going to grade and give a, a, a specific grade to that is going to be a permanent grade, that's a summative assessment. Okay. Um, again, lesson plans. They're, they're your most important means of organizing. Um, through your music ed program here, through Dr. Brumfield, you're going to learn one template of possibly something that will work for you. Maybe some of those ideas work for you. Through band techniques and curriculum, you're going to learn another one. Maybe somewhere else if you go and teach or something, you'll see others. You'll find out others when you student teach from those teachers. You need to find something that works for you, that you can stick with it and have a plan. If you don't know what you want to teach the child or if you don't know what you want that child to do at the end of that session where you're teaching them, how are you supposed to teach them anything? How are they supposed to learn anything? If you can't even identify clearly what that is, what it will take for them to get that in your best estimation and how you're going to relay that and how you're going to tell whether they can do it or not or whether they understand it or not. Teaching is very, very, very complicated, um, but it's very stimulating work. And if you don't plan, you're not, you're not approaching it in a professional enough manner. You absolutely have to do that. Last thing on here, correspondence. Um, this kind of fits into environment because basically parents obviously are important um, in this whole process. And their perception of the environment you're setting up, which if you're doing your job right, is a learning environment, a musical learning environment, where that is the number one priority, is to learn music properly for good reasons, good intent, and it's an enjoyable uh, uh, series of events doing it every day. Um, you need to have good contact with parents because otherwise they're going to get all the impression they have hearsay, secondhand, thirdhand. They're still going to get that information, but if they're getting additional information from you, if they have opportunity to meet with you individually before the child even enters your program and so forth, then you can convey what your expectations are, why you do certain things, and in a lot of cases how this experience may be what you're, that you're going to provide is going to be much much different than the experience maybe they had 30 years earlier because as a profession the way we do this has changed drastically and I'm sure will continue to so with all that now think back you should have taken some notes you can ask some questions on the class discussion board. You can make some comments. You can talk about some of your past experiences, some things you've seen that have been disasters, some things that you've seen that have been total successes. And you're finished with this video. Thank you very much.